Hey y'all, what's up? My name is Avery, and today we're going to be talking about chronic illnesses. Hello, if you didn't know me, my name is Avery, and I am a booktuber here on YouTube, where I mostly talk about romance books, and many of you may or may not know that I actually have a chronic illness. I have a few other... <laughs> things going on um, when it comes to my health, but today we're just going to be focusing on chronic illnesses. Now the reason why I really wanted to make this video, there are a bunch of reasons. Um, I recently had one of my episodes, which I don't know if other people who have my condition call it an episode. Um, I'm going to talk about my condition later on in the video, um, but I call it an episode. I had one of my episodes a couple of days ago, and I haven't had one before that in over a year. It was obviously very scary and jarring and really shocking to go through. Um, it's never something fun to go through. I really wanted to talk about this because I know that things like this can be very scary for some people. I just wanted to make a video that I hope that other people can relate to and to show them that they're not alone in the way that they're feeling and the way that they have been underrepresented in the world. Um, because I do feel like people who have chronic illnesses are underrepresented and people don't know a lot about us so I thought I would educate you. So this video is going to have some parts to it. The first part I'm just going to be describing what a chronic illness is and um, then I'm going to talk about my uh, condition and my journey with it and then the last part of the video is going to be talking about some books that I have read that have chronic illness representation in it which are very few. I feel like that is something we need more of in this community, in any community. I do not recall or know of any movie or a TV show or any other form of media besides a book where I have seen chronic illness representation in it. I've seen disability rep for sure. I love seeing disability rep. I consider, I label myself as having a disability. I know other people don't. Um, I personally do. I feel like it's fine. Some people find it a derogatory term, whereas I don't. I would say that it is an individual person's preference on whether or not they like to use the word disability. I'm perfectly fine with it. If you know of any movies or TV shows that have chronic illness representation in them, please link them down below or comment them down below for me because I want to see that representation. I want to watch that. And then I'm also going to talk about some books that have chronic illness representation that I want to read. I have not read them yet, but I really want to read them. First off, we're going to be talking about what a chronic illness is. I have found some links, I'm linking them all down below, certain definitions and phrases and just lists of things that I can read off to you because I myself am not best known knowledgeable person about these sorts of things and so I'd rather read a summary or definition off for you um, just so I know that y'all are getting the correct information. This is a definition of a chronic illness and this is from WebMD. It says, a chronic illness is a condition that lasts for a very long time and usually cannot be cured completely. Although some illnesses can be controlled or managed through lifestyle like diet or exercise and certain medications. Examples of chronic illnesses include diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, kidney disease, HIV, slash AIDS, lupus, and multiple sclerosis. There are many more I can't list them all for you. I don't even know of some. So you can't go and search on Google because I have tried. I've done extensive research about this. You can't go and search on Google. I want a list of every single chronic illness that there is out there. I have not found one. I can't find one. I would have listed it off for you. I can't find one. My condition was not listed here. I have friends whose their conditions are not listed here. There are so many more conditions that are not listed in that list I just said. Some people are born with this condition and some people are not. It develops over time. I am going to be talking about a book later um, called Good Life Chloe Brown that has chronic illness in it and she did not have it when she was born. She had pneumonia which sparked her having this chronic illness that she has. These are some characteristics of a chronic illness that I have found from betterhealth.gov that I thought was very educational. So here are just some of the characteristics a chronic illness has. Chronic illnesses are mostly characterized by complex causes, many risk factors, a long latency periods, time between onset of the illness and feelings it affects. It is a long illness. It's a functional impairment or disability. Most chronic illnesses do not fix themselves and are generally not cured completely. Some can be immediately life-threatening such as a heart disease or stroke. Others linger over time and need intensive management such as diabetes. Most chronic illnesses persist through a person's life but are not always the cause of death such as arthritis. There are so many different kinds of chronic illnesses to so many different degrees of severity. Just because someone has one chronic illness does not mean that somebody who also has a chronic illness experiences the same 
thing. They don't go through the same thing. They don't have the same symptoms. Every person is unique. Let me know down below if you have any questions about this subject, um, about chronic illnesses at all. I have actually posted something on Instagram, on my story, a couple, like a week or two ago, where I was talking about how I was having an episode and I really wanted to make this video. And it shocked me how many people responded to my story saying how they'd love to see something like this because they themselves have a chronic illness which sh it shocked me i didn't know there were so many other people like me in just our small community like i had like 10 people message me like that's crazy so again their chronic illnesses are way different than my own we're not all the same at all even if you have the same chronic illness as somebody else those are not the same either. They're at different forms of severity. It just depends on the person again. So if you have any questions about the term chronic illness and just any questions at all you have about it, please leave them down below and hopefully I have an answer for you. So now we're going to be talking about my chronic illness and my experience with mine. Um, so mine is called POTS. It's actually an acronym. I don't normally outright tell people I have POTS, I state the whole condition out word for word because <laughs> when people hear the word POT, they associate it with something else, which is something I don't do. <laughs> I like to state the whole entire condition out word for word, which is called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So POTS is the acronym for that. And I also have um, an autoimmune disease. I have celiac disease. I have anemia and hypermobility. My hypermobility and celiac disease are both linked to my POTS, which I had no idea about. <laughs> but uh, through me figuring out this condition, they are linked. So I'll talk about that. Here I'm going to be giving a definition of POTS. Every single person who has POTS is different. We are not the same. I follow a few people on TikTok who have POTS. I know one girl, she faints more than 10 times a day. She faints constantly. Um, and then I follow another girl who has a service dog to help her with her POTS, which I do not. But there are so many different forms of it. Just because I have certain things about my POTS does not mean that everybody else who has POTS is the exact same as me. Just like I said earlier about chronic illnesses, not every person's chronic illness is the same. I'm going to be reading a, another definition for you because it's kind of hard to explain and I'd probably ramble about the definition. So I'd rather just form it in a very concise format for y'all. This is from clevelandclinic.org. Postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or POTS is a condition that affects circulation or blood flow. It involves the autonomic nervous system, which automatically controls and regulates vital bodily functions and sympathetic nervous system, which activates the fight or flight response. POTS is a form of orthostatic intolerance, the development of symptoms that come on when standing up from a reclining position and that may be relieved by sitting down or laying down. The primary symptom of an orthostatic intolerance is lightheadedness, fainting, and uncomfortable rapid increase in heartbeat. That is the medical term for saying that. I'm gonna dumb it down for you. <laughs> I have a blood regulating disorder to where my blood in my body likes to pool to my lower extremities. So that means my fingertips and my feet. When I'm standing up, all the blood goes down my arm to my fingers. And when I'm standing up, all the blood leaves my body to go to my feet. So I don't have a lot of blood flow in my brain as much as I do in my feet. My feet are swollen most of the time, as are my fingers. I can't wear rings when I work out or when I walk because they'll get stuck because my fingers will swell up <laughs> while I walk. So that's another factoid for you about that. Something that happens to me since blood is leaving my brain and going towards my feet, my body reacts in a way to make me faint so that I can lay down and the blood can get regulated back to my brain. So my body is forcing me to faint so that I can lay down and get blood to the brain. I do not spur them on, my body just does it, which bodies are crazy and insane. Just, just your body makes you faint so that it can get more blood, like it knows to do that. I think that's crazy, <laughs> but also really cool, but also not because I don't like fainting. So I'm gonna be talking about the symptoms in a second, but I really wanted to touch up on something that I read in this article that I found on clevelandclinic.org. It states, when certain autoimmune conditions such as Sergen's syndrome and celiac disease 
can be at a higher risk. I was diagnosed with celiac disease when I was seven years old. Celiac disease is an intolerance to gluten. I am on a strict gluten-free diet because my body cannot digest gluten. Just from me having celiac disease makes the possibility higher that I would have had this condition. So I recommend if you have either surgeons or celiac disease, I would recommend figuring out whether or not you do have POTS because it is a possibility. And then another factoid that I found is the majority of POTS patients are women ages 13 to 50 years old. About 4,500 people suffer from POTS in the United States. That's like a lot of people, but it's also not a lot of people, if that makes sense. So I'm gonna list the symptoms, <laughs> which are a bunch, and then afterward I'm gonna be talking about which ones I have specifically. High or low blood pressure, high or low heart rate or a racing heart, chest pain, dizziness, lightheadedness, especially when standing up, prolonged standing in one position or long walks, fainting or near fainting, exhaustion slash fatigue, abdominal pain and bloating, nausea, temperature deregulation, hot or cold, nervous jittery feeling, forgetfulness and trouble focusing, brain fog, blurred vision, headaches and body pains slash aches, may feel like the flu, neck pain, insomnia and frequent awakenings from sleep, chest pain and heart racing during sleep, excessive sweating, shakiness slash tremors, especially when adrenaline surges, discoloration of feet or hands, exercise intolerance, excessive or lack of sweating, diarrhea and or constipation and swelling hands and feet. Those were just the symptoms listed on that website. I'm gonna be going through the ones that I have specifically. I have an abnormally high heart rate so my heart works way harder than other people's to get my blood circulating correctly so since i have pots my blood vessels my veins in my body are bigger than other people's that's why it pools to my feet is because my veins in my body are bigger than other people's like maybe some person's regular vein would be like this thick whereas mine would be thicker than that i have an abnormally high heart rate so a normal heart rate for, for a person is anywhere between like, I would say like 60 and 80 beats per minute. That's like the normal heart rate for a person. Their resting heart rate, resting heart rate. Whereas mine is more uh, like 85, 90 range is my resting heart rate. One of the things on here is says exercise intolerance. I'm not able to do certain exercises or mostly exercise at all because when I get my heart rate going, it's very dangerous. Your maximum heart rate for a person is 220 minus your age. So me being 22 years old, my maximum heart rate is 198 beats per minute. Once I reach that threshold, you are at risk for a heart attack. Me running on the treadmill or running in general makes my heart rate go to 190, which is very close to 198. <laughs> So my main form of working out is walking at a steep incline in the gym. If I am walking at a steep incline outside, it gets even higher because we have outside forces such as the sun. Racing heart rate, high heart rate for me. That's why I am constantly wearing this watch. You'll see I always wear my Apple watch because it tracks your heart rate and it'll indicate to me if my heart rate is too high or abnormally high or even low because sometimes my heart rate does dip low it's gone to the 40s before which is also dangerous <laughs> i experience dizziness and lightheadedness often especially when standing up so when you stand up from sitting down or laying down all the blood goes to your feet when you stand up so i get very lightheaded and dizzy when i stand up or even when I'm walking for a long period of time. Fainting and near fainting, I have those experiences, which I will be talking about later. Um, exhaustion slash fatigue. I've always been an exhausted and fatigued person ever since I was little. I was known as the tired person. I am always cold, <laughs> so that's one here. Forgetfulness or trouble focusing. This mainly happens a lot when I am having a fainting episode. I will talk about that later too, but I don't remember things when I have an episode or when it's near an episode. I don't remember things at all, which is kind of scary for me. Blurred vision, I have a horrible eyesight in general, so um, headaches and body aches or pains. I have chronic neck pain as well. Um, I have a hypermobile neck. Hypermobility just means you're more bendy than other people. Like, I can bend like this. 
that's like my neck too. I can bend it back pretty far. <laughs> so that comes with chronic neck pain as well as back pain. I get headaches and migraines often, which are very hard to um, alleviate. Insomnia, I have a horrible time sleeping. Lack of sweating, I don't really sweat at all. I maybe get a little bit of pers- like get, get, get maybe a little bit of perspiration on my back a little bit, but I don't sweat. I don't sweat. I, I, I can smell bad. <laughs> don't get me wrong, I can smell bad if I work out. But I don't, I don't have those feelings where I need to bring, like when you go to the gym, I don't need a rag to wipe my face or anything like that. My hands might get a little clammy, but like, I don't sweat, basically. When it says diarrhea and or constipation, um, I already have that with my uh, autoimmune disorder with celiac disease. That's another um, characteristic of that. So I go through that a lot as well. And um, I already talked to you about my swelling hands and feet. So I have a lot of these symptoms. <laughs> another thing that I have found really hard for me, and I don't know if it's the same for other people who have POTS, standing up fast is hard. Where I think for people in general who have POTS is standing up fast is hard. Going up and going down like standing up and standing down, standing up, standing down is so bad for me. I can faint from that. And um, putting my head down for something is really bad, makes me really dizzy, very fatigued. Um, and also sitting at a bar stool. We've learned this through experience. We have found that when I sit on a bar stool, all the blood goes to my feet and they're just dangling there. And when I stand up, who do I have a dizzy spell? <laughs> I thought I would talk about my story and how I was diagnosed and everything for y'all. So I actually was not diagnosed with POTS until I was a junior in high school, which was when I was 17. I am now 22, so it's been five years since I was diagnosed. I have always had these symptoms. We just didn't know I had POTS until I was 17. So first of all, to get this started, I thought I would start from the very beginning and tell y'all about the instances when I was a kid that have made me realize back then that I definitely have had this my whole life. I would faint when I did sports as a kid. Um, my pediatrician would just state that I had exercised induced asthma. It's a whole it's a whole nother topic talking about doctors when it comes to chronic illnesses. It kind of makes me angry and kind of also nervous to talk about. <laughs> I feel like that in and of itself could be a whole video. But basically a lot of doctors out there, um, general doctors, don't really put chronic illnesses into a possibility, you know? They kind of like write it off, if that makes sense. A lot of doctors, general doctors that you have, that won't be a first thing, go-to thing that they think of. Um, a chronic oh you might have a chronic illness a lot of times they'll just be like oh you might have a headache go home and go to sleep they don't stop to think about oh she is having a lot of headaches maybe she might have this 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 or this chronic illness chronic illnesses are not seen you can't physically see them on people it's not a disability to where you need a wheelchair most of the time in some cases you do it's not something that other people can see with their eyes so a lot of people don't stop to consider whether or not somebody may have it i'm gonna stop my rant about doctors because that could be a whole video in and of itself so they said i had exercise induced asthma i would faint a lot on the soccer field or when i stopped running when i was on the soccer field um, and i was a midfielder um, and if you know anything about soccer midfielders are the people who basically are defending and on offense. So they go back and forth. So that's a lot of running. So whenever I would stop running or the game was over, I would pass out. There were multiple times where my parents would take me to the ER not knowing what was wrong with me because my eyes would be glassy. I would pass out. I wouldn't know where I was. And this was me being a kid under the age of 12. Something that I had also growing up that I didn't know was also a side effect of POTS was when I stood up, I would always have to grab the wall and hold it for a second because I would see black spots. And then I'd stand there for a moment, wait for it to go away and go about my day. I didn't know that wasn't normal. <laughs> That's not something you ask, you know? I, that happened my whole entire life. I didn't know that wasn't normal. I just didn't know it wasn't normal to grab the wall and steady myself while I just saw black and spots in my vision. I didn't know that wasn't normal as a kid because I've had that my whole life. There was also one incident as a kid that, um, stood out to me because normally my fainting would happen when I was in sports, but there was one incident that happened. Um, looking back on it now, that was definitely a POTS episode for me. So when I was a kid, I had, at one time I had a cut right in the crease of my little finger right here. And I went to the restroom to go to the bathroom. And um, I looked down while I'm using the restroom 
and in my sleep or somehow I ended up opening up the cut and blood was gushing out of it so I hurriedly stood up and went to go run to my parents bedroom to tell them like my finger was bleeding excessively and I remember running into the couch and then next thing I know I'm like on the floor like I'm on the floor like sprawled on the floor I don't know how long I was there I, I just got up and walked to my parents bedroom and told them about my finger. They thought that me passing out was a reaction to the blood that I saw. Looking back, it's not. I've never had an issue with blood before. I've had an issue with like needles and stuff because that's gross. I've never had another fainting episode when it comes to blood of myself before. Looking back, it's because I stood up so fast and started running to their bedroom and I ran into the couch and that made me pass out. Normally when I'm in those episodes, when I pass out, I don't remember a thing. I don't know what happened. I I don't know what happened. All I can remember is pass is is hitting the couch and the next thing I know I am on the floor. I don't know how long I was on the floor. I don't know how long I was passed out. That's happened a few times in my life and I will be talking about that in a second. So this whole experience of me figuring out that I have POTS started with one specific incidents. This was, I believe, the summer before my junior year of high school. My mom, my sister, and I were house sitting for one of our family friends and they have a pool and we didn't. So we took our dog and swam in their pool for the day and when I came back I was watching um, something on my computer. I was watching a movie or a show, I don't really remember, on my on my computer and I had a little um, like a sitting nook like against the window. Like it was a a seat attached to the window um, that I could sit and lay in and read books in and so I just sat there with my laptop in my lap watching this show. I felt a little tired and a little dizzy so I decided to get up and go lay on my bed and watch it instead. So I got up, laid on my bed and the next thing I know I wake up with this horrible ringing in my ears which is something that happens in every single episode I've realized. I wake up with a horrible ringing in my ears and I have no idea where I am. No idea where I am, who I am for a second there. No idea what's going on. And I just remember screaming for my mom and telling her that I felt really dizzy. And sometimes when I have felt dizzy before this, I would just do deep breathing and walk back and forth and walk it off. So was, she was asking me if I was okay and if she needed to call an ambulance. I don't remember what was happening or what I was saying, but I just told her I didn't feel good and she could tell by my eyes, I was like disassociating, I was not myself. I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna stand up and walk it off. And she was like, okay, okay. And she's next to me. I stand on the floor and I lean over my bed to take a breather and I'm out again. I'm completely out. <laughs> and my sister ended up calling an ambulance for me. I can get little snippets here and there of like what happened. I remember at one point, um, I believe my mom laid me on the floor and one of my best friends lived down the street from me and her mom came over and her mom was laying with me and um, like whispering like it's gonna be okay and that's the only things I can remember. I was put in the ambulance, brought to the hospital. By the time I made it to the hospital, I was fine. I was traumatized <laughs> by the experience, but my body was fine. I was crying obviously and everything. It was traumatic, but I myself felt fine. Again, with the thing about doctors. <laughs> so my, I was taken to the hospital, as I just said. They just told me I had a panic attack. That's all they said. Oh, she probably just had a panic attack. Just take her home, she's fine. I am still so pissed about something like this. I'm really, uh, Doctors frustrate me to no end because they don't stop to think about the little things that could be going on with people or like the things that people don't normally think about. That's something that could happen to them. It makes me upset nowadays thinking about it because if my mom like didn't look more into this, I would never know I had what I had. Growing up, I always had issues with my stomach and everything and my pediatrician would always just tell my mom she has a stomach bug, she's fine, and my mom always had an inkling that no something else is wrong. Through my mom's persistence and her having me go to so many different doctors, that's when we found out I had celiac disease. That's when we found out. My pediatrician didn't tell me I had celiac disease. My mom knew something was wrong with me. My mom thought the same thing in this instance. but. She can't, she doesn't know everything. She's not a doctor herself, so she doesn't know what's going on. A couple days later, or the next day, my mom was like, okay, if she had an anxiety attack, which I didn't, I, I've had anxiety attacks, that wasn't an anxiety attack. <laughs> She's like, how about let's get her into the gym 
maybe help her work out a little. So I went on the elliptical with my mom, I went to the gym and I'm on there for like maybe a couple minutes. And my mom looks at me and looks at the screen and the screen can tell you how fast you're going, what your heart rate is and everything. And she did a double take and was like, what the heck? And she's looking at my heart rate on the elliptical. And I was like, that is not normal. I don't remember what heart rate I had in this instance, but it was higher than a normal person's should be while slowly going on an elliptical. My mom took it upon herself to visit as many doctors as possible to try and figure out what was going on with me. Um, thanks to her, uh, we figured it out. I ended up seeing a cardiologist, a neurologist, an endocrinologist, it, a bunch of ologists. A cardiologist is a heart doctor, a neurologist is a brain doctor, an endocrinologist deals with your thyroid. And I saw plenty of other doctors. I had some tests done on me. I did a stress test. If you want to know what a stress test is, go look it up. It is horrible. They basically um, monitor you while you're on a treadmill for a while. They make you do certain things on the treadmill. There's one point in the test where they make you hyperventilate and it is horrible. It is one of the worst experiences I've had. I've also had to do an echocardiogram and that is basically where they do an ultrasound on your heart to see what's going on. That experienced stunk as well because uh, I, at this point I was 17. So I went to Texas Children's. I was not an adult yet. And me being a 17 year old woman who developed early in life, I kind of had, I have generous sized you know, an echocardiogram is a ultrasound on your heart and which is basically above your left boob, just so you know. So it's basically like an ultrasound, it's like a stick and it gets shoved into your ribs, like shoved into your body. Like it's like this constant hard pressure and it was on my boobs and everything and it was in my chest. It is another horrible experience, but I had to go through that as well. After all the tests and everything, my cardiologist finally diagnosed me with postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. When I was first diagnosed, I actually had to take medication. Um, I took a beta blocker, I believe it was called fludrocortisone, possibly, I don't remember. Um, I'm not on it anymore. My car after a while of me taking it, my cardiologist um, recommended that I was weaned off of it. It was a really big shock for me, especially <laughs> just a 17 year old girl going through all of this is not fun or anybody going through all of this is not fun. I was put into physical therapy, which looking back on it was one of the best things I could have done. Physical therapy was amazing for me. Physical therapy taught me how to work out without raising my heart rate, of how to alleviate migraines, of how to breathe properly because I needed to learn different ways of breathing and different breathing techniques. Also, physical therapy taught me how to walk correctly because apparently my whole life before that point, I was not walking correctly. Um, due to my hypermobility, to me being very bendy, I would always walk with locked knees. I didn't know there was any other way. I didn't know I was doing anything wrong. I basically had to learn how to bend my knees to walk properly and not lock them up after every single time I take a step. It was such a beneficial experience for me, but it was hard. It was a very hard thing to go through. Through all of this, I had to quit playing softball in high school, I was on the JV softball team. I had to quit uh, because I couldn't run around, I couldn't do certain things, but luckily my coach was really understanding and I was the manager for the softball team, which was a fun, fun time. I also had problems when it came to my school <laughs> um, and me having a chronic illness. More specifically, just that junior year. Senior year was fine for me, but that year I was diagnosed was really rough with my relationship in school. Because I had to go to physical therapy and physical therapy was helping me so much, they closed right around the same time or an hour after my school did. And I had softball after school and my physical therapy place was not in the same city. It was maybe a 30 to 35 minute drive away. And so I always had to go before school. It would cut into my first period of the day. That was excused at least. At least I got to be excused from that. My teacher that I had for that period, I had AP history, AP world history or AP US history, I don't remember, but I had a history teacher 
and I would come in late a lot, but with a note, like there was a reason why I was late to class. She, I could tell she was just so upset that I was late every single day and I wouldn't really get the help that I needed from my teacher to help me because I was behind. I, w I didn't get that help. I guess that's also a contributor why history is my least favorite subject in school. That experience really tainted me with history. It came to a point to where I wasn't getting the help that I needed or the accommodations that I needed for this class that I had to drop from AP to grade level, which I was so disappointed in myself because I thought that was horrible to do, which in the grand scheme of things was the best thing I could have done because I would not have done well in that class if I stayed in it. When you have a disability or you have not need accommodations when it comes to school, you have to have like a meeting with teachers and advisors and principals and nurses and everything. Um, I'm actually learning about it right now in my teaching with disabilities course I'm taking in school. I'm studying to become a teacher and I absolutely love my teaching with disabilities class. So I had something called a 504 meeting. This is for people who don't need a special education to help with their disability. They just need certain accommodations or modifications as advised from their doctor. So I need certain things when it came to schooling. I needed extra time on tests because my brain couldn't focus. I needed an excuse to stand up during class because you'd be sitting down for so long, all the blood would pull to my feet. And I needed to walk. I needed to get the blood moving in my body. And so I had accommodation to get up whenever I wanted. I had accommodations to take breaks and walk around during tests and exams. At the beginning of the year, every single year you're in school, you have one of these meetings with your teachers. My junior year, I walk into my meeting and only my softball coach is there and the nurse and the counselor, the only people that are there. And I had like six or seven teachers. Walking in, I didn't know that that wasn't normal. Um, I now know that was not normal. I don't know why my teachers didn't come. I don't think it was okay that they didn't show up. When I'm a teacher, I'm going to every single 504 meeting. But when senior year hit, I had another 504 meeting with my teachers and I, my mom and I were a little bit late. We were running a little late and we walk in and every single chair in the room is filled. Like every one of my teachers is there. And I was honestly shocked. I was like, why are these people here? Like they weren't, they weren't here last time. What's going on? And these were different teachers than last, the, the year before. Turns out that's normal. That's what you should do in a school setting. As a teacher, you need to be there for your student. You need to understand what modifications and accommodations they need to be in order to be successful in your class. Junior year was not my jam was not my year. Senior year was so much better though for me. So that's a plus. Another thing that I had to do um, when I was feeling potsy, <laughs> I call it potsy. I think other people who have pots also call it this too. I don't know how that term got in my head. When I'm feeling symptoms of pots and I'm feeling like the blood pooling and everything, my mom and I call it feeling potsy. I tell her, hey, I'm feeling potsy today. I can't really do this. So whenever I was feeling potsy during the day, I could go to the nurse and request elevator access. Or I could ask a teacher if they could go open the elevator for me because you need a special key to open the elevator. So after that whole experience um, in my bed and take me to the hospital, I didn't really have all that many afterward for about a year. I believe it was because I was going through physical therapy and really it was helping me a lot. Then once I graduated high school, I started having episodes in my sleep, which I did not know was a thing. I would fall asleep and I would wake up with this ringing in my ears, not knowing who I was or where I was. They would happen in my sleep, which was crazy because I'd wake up and forget about them because the side effect to having these episodes for me is I forget stuff. I don't remember what I said, what I did. I had an episode the other day and I've asked my sister because she came over at least three times of what we talked about when she came over because I do not know at all. I had like so many of those in my sleep which was crazy. Two other episodes that really stick out to me. They stick out because they happened in public. <laughs> Both of them were in a work setting. I had an episode in the daycare that I worked at um, during my gap year in between my sophomore and junior year of college. I worked at a daycare for a year and I was a nanny for a year. And so when I was working at this daycare, it was a couple weeks after I had the flu. And so that's why people thought I passed out, but that's not why I passed out. So it was my first day back after having the flu. I'm helping kids open up snacks at the snack table and um, I get really woozy for a second. So I go to sit down in one of like the little kid chairs, at the little kid table. Next thing I know, I wake up completely on the floor, face first on the floor. 
um, not knowing where I am. Again, ringing in my ears. I have no idea where I am or who I am. I don't know what's going on at all. It takes a while for the grogginess and fogginess to go away. My mom ended up picking me up and everything and we just knew it was an episode, so. Again, I don't really know what sparks the episodes a lot. Um, that's something I possibly will never know. And another episode that I had that really sticks out is one that happened when I was a nanny. I was just sitting on the couch, chilling with the twins that I used to nanny. They had a couch where it was two pieces of a couch that were shoved together. And I was apparently sitting in the crack in between where the two of them came together and they were playing with like cars. Well, I get really dizzy. I reach over to grab some water to drink. And the next thing I know, I am on the floor in between both couches. Both couches have separated. I am on the floor. Water is all over me. Apparently the kids didn't even notice <laughs> they were having fun. Um, but I like called their mom into the room and she was so nice and drove me home. I don't really know what causes it i still don't know um the other day the episode that i had i so that was about a year ago when the one at the my job happened and so then the one that spurred all of this on <laughs> this whole idea of me making this video was it happened in my room in my apartment um i was doing homework in the kitchen i was sitting at one of the bar stools i was cooking dinner while i was doing homework and i submitted one of my assignments and i walked into my room to check it off my to-do list um, cause I love doing that and I started feeling a little dizzy. So I went to go sit in my desk chair, but I immediately got up and I was like, I need to lay down. Um, and so I remember crawling onto the bed and next thing I know, I wake up starfished on the bed, not knowing where I am again, who or who I am for a little bit. And I end up calling my mom and it was, it's never a fun experience. The reason why we think I had this episode is we've realized that when I'm on my period, my POTS is way worse. Because of the bleeding going on down there, um, all the blood is pooling there even more than normal. So we think it mixed with my period triggered this one. So we don't honestly know though. <laughs> it's something I'll never really know the answer to, I don't think. And it's very frustrating, but um, it's something that I've gotten used to, if that makes sense. So some things that I wanted to talk about um, were some facts about my chronic illness and what I have to go through. I personally can't stand up for a long period of time or I'll get dizzy. Um, again, all the blood is pulling to my feet. The sun drains everything out of me. The sun just makes my heart, makes me hotter, which makes my heart beat faster, which really drains me in energy. Something else that happened to me that comes with POTS is I have hypermobility, my joints are very bendy, um, but I can, I have chronic back pain because of this. And so um, I think I was playing Superman. If you know how to play Superman, like you put the kid on your feet when you're laying on your back um, and you make them fly around like Superman. I was doing that with one of the kids that I nanny and I felt a little tweak in my back. I was in the car to drive home. It was maybe a 15 minute drive from the house that I used to nanny to my parents' house. Every time I would lift my foot to put on the gas or the brake, I would scream bloody murder because it hurt so bad. It was horrible. I finally drove home, parked in my driveway. Nobody was home and um, had to call my mom. I was screaming, crying. I could not move. I couldn't move at all. Luckily, one of my neighbors came over and they picked me up, carried me inside. Instances like that happen to me where if a nerve is pinched or tweaked in my body, I can't move. There are instances where it happens in my chest and my dad literally needs to crack my chest for me to breathe. That hasn't happened in many years, but that has, very, that has happened before. I also am not able to take hot baths um, because of the hot water. It again gets my heart racing. And there have been many instances where I'll stand up after the bath and immediately have to sit back down and even lay out like no clothing on, on the tile floor to cool myself off or make myself not faint. So I don't take hot baths, which sucks because I love baths. I cannot wear hairbands or headbands for very long. It has to be, if I'm wearing my hair up, it has to be either in braids, French braids, or a very low ponytail or bun. I'm taking this out immediately after I do this video or else I will have a migraine for the rest of the day and not able to do anything. I don't know why my hair has, all, my hair is just like that. I one time fell asleep with a top knot in my hair and woke up in excruciating pain. It is 
not fun. I've had a couple of heart rate monitors to help me keep up with my heart rate to learn more about it, understand it more. I first started out with one that would go underneath my chest area and it would link to a watch. I believe it was called a polar sonar one. I'm not sure though. And then I upgraded to a Fitbit and then I finally upgraded to an Apple watch, which out of all of them, more accurately tracks my heart rate and it'll even put it on a chart for me. And I have it listed here. You can't really see it all that well, but I have it like the biggest thing on my watch that I can just tap on is my heart rate. And it'll tell me my high and low for the day and even give me a chart of it for me. But there is an issue with the Apple watch when it comes to my heart rate. A lot of the times when I have episodes, it won't track it on here because something that happens with the heart rate monitor on your Apple watch is it won't track your heart rate every single minute of the day. It maybe spreads it out every five minutes or every 10 minutes will track your heart rate. I might have an episode in the five minutes that Apple doesn't track my heart rate. So I honestly don't know if my heart rate skyrockets or drops in those instances because I haven't tracked it. I had one time where they had the heart monitor on me for many days that a doctor put on me to track my heart rate. But again, I don't have episodes every single day. So they didn't track anything. They didn't find any abnormality because I didn't have an episode in that time period. I know they make a special uh, drink powder to help people with POTS. It constricts your blood vessels. Um, I have those. I have not tried them yet. I'm kind of nervous too because I heard they taste bad, but <laughs> I want to try those to see if they work. I also am starting to take supplements. I went to a nutritionist to help her maybe see if certain things I eat can trigger things. And so um, she helped me get put on a bunch of supplements. I'm on a B12, a B Supreme. I'm on, I think it's called Selomethanine, if that's correct. It affects your thyroid but yeah I'm taking supplements I've been taking them for over a year and I honestly think that is the reason why I have not had an episode in a very long time until recently I also have realized that standing up for a long period of time to film a video is very hard for me I have learned from experience so when I first started my booktube journey over two years ago or three years ago I think it was three my favorite booktuber that I've watched all the time was Christine Riccio at Pull and Bananas Books. And um, she would stand up and have so much energy in every single one of her videos. And I thought I had to be like that. And so I'd film all my videos standing up with a tripod and everything. I've since realized that takes so much energy out of me standing up for that long time. The film a video makes me like the most exhausted ever for the rest of the day. I even have an experience where I believe I was doing my 2019 favorites video. I think I was talking about Love or Mine, which is right here by J.R. Ward. I was talking about this book in my favorites of 2019. I remember it. Um, I was standing up for that video and there was one point, I have it on film. I don't think I have it anymore. I got a new computer. I don't have all that footage anymore. But when I was talking about that book, there was one point where I cut off mid sentence and immediately just sat on the floor because I felt so faint. So instances like that have happened to me. Since I have migraines, chronic migraines, um, my neurologist, when I had one, when I was in high school still, um, advised for me to get Botox. You can get Botox in your face to alleviate migraines, um, which I thought it would have helped a lot. I get headache, I get a headache almost every day and migraines are not new for me, were not new for me at that point. I really wanted to try, we um, tried to do it or you have to like go ask your insurance if you can do it and they declined it. So I was not able to do that. I am always a dehydrated person. Uh, it has something to do with the blood flow again. Um, so I'm constantly drinking water, which means I'm constantly going to the bathroom. I have a small bladder in and of itself. So if you know me, I pee all the time. <laughs> I try to have as many balanced meals as possible, um, which is really hard for some people in college for some reason. A lot of people my age don't really eat their fruits and veggies. Um, so I have to be very specific with my diet um, or else if I eat too, something that has too much sodium in it, that could trigger something um, <laughs> and just things like that. Foods can trigger you. I've realized that, um, which is crazy to me that a food can trigger a fainting spell. I also have a device to show you that I have found to be so beneficial for me with my chronic illness. It is called the Hypersphere. Um, it's a ball like this big. I'll take it out for you, but you have to charge it. So I haven't used it in a while. I use it when I'm feeling very bad and potsy. Um, it has a ball this big, you charge it. And when you turn it on, it'll vibrate. And um, you can press this on certain points 
um, like nerves. I do this a lot in my back when I'm having a pinched nerve and it is the pinched nerve makes me have a horrible migraine because certain nerves in your body connect to things you never thought they could. That's what I learned in physical therapy. This has really helped me when I feel horrible. Um, so I really recommend that. And then something else that my physical therapist advised for me to do that was so beneficial for me in high school. I don't use these anymore. I'm only I only use these when I'm feeling very potsy and really bad, um, but they are compression stockings. I have a few here. So it's basically just a stocking. Um, you can have one that cover your toes or don't, um, but it has this um, little sticky stuff inside. This like goes on your thigh and it goes all the way down your leg. And they're like kind of like tight sockings that you wear throughout the day. I have, I had black ones, I tan ones, and I even have cute little um, fox ones, cat ones. <laughs> this really helps the blood get flowing in those legs and hopefully will get the blood from your legs go back up to your body. I was that girl in school who wore chacos every day to school. I had to wear my compression stockings every single day in high school, basically, M majority of junior year. In high school, you weren't allowed to wear shorts. Girls weren't allowed to wear shorts, which is still ridiculous to me. So underneath all my leggings, all of my jeans, I wore these. I was hot. Um, and I also wore chacos. This is the foot part of it. So this is where the heel goes. And then your toes will maybe stick out over here. This is open right here. And so I'd wear my chacos with those. So I had kind of wear like socks, it kind of looked like I wore socks with Chacos, which was <laughs> pretty funny, but everyone around me knew what was going on. So it was perfectly fine for me. I didn't really care. Um, I just wanted to feel better and these really helped me feel better. So I really recommend compression stockings if you're having blood regulation issues. That is my story, it's very long. Let me know down below if you have any questions. I, I'd love to answer them. I'm perfectly fine with talking about anything going on with my chronic illness. So now we're gonna be talking about the last section of this video, which we'll be talking about books that have this representation in it. Um, I have only read a few that had this representation in it, but I wanted to talk about them. So one that I feel like if you have a chronic illness, you need to read this book, like you need to. And it's a YA contemporary called Sick Kids in Love by Hannah Moskowitz. This is kind of like, I would say an ode to people who have a chronic illness. Our heroine has rheumatoid arthritis and our hero, I think it's called Gaucher disease. It's pretty hard to pronounce in the book. The heroine has a hard time pronouncing it as well. I loved it so much. I felt so seen in a book. I've never felt this seen in a book. I remember I posted a reading vlog where I read this book for the first time and I was honestly just crying because I found myself in a book. I wanted to read a quote for you that just really spoke to me. Hopefully it speaks to other people too. So by the way, this book is all in first person of our heroine named um, Isabel. So she's talking about her dad and how her dad views her chronic illness. And she says, my dad's always been horrified by it. I say, he doesn't want me to define myself by my illness or whatever. Sasha, who is our hero in the story, widens his eyes. Healthy people are so weird about that. I don't know how they've developed this fear of it. Was there an after school special that they all saw? Like at some point, every healthy person saw some TV show about how you shouldn't let sick people define themselves by their illness, whatever the F that even means. And they were all sitting there like taking notes saying, uh-huh, oh yes, very smart, thank you. I will not let them. And then Isabel responds by saying, you can define yourself by your illness as long as you're an Olympic athlete, who's overcoming it? Yes, Sasha says, you either have to be overcoming it or you have to be completely disconnected from it. God forbid it be an important part of your identity that you're just living with it. Why is that? It's because they can't imagine it, I say. They think it's completely ridiculous that a person can just have a sick life and be fine with it. You have to build this story around kicking the illness's butt you can't coexist with it. You can't incorporate yourself into it because they don't, so you can't. That quote is just one of many that made me feel so seen about people. A lot of people, when they hear about chronic illnesses or when I talk about my symptoms and everything, one the main thing that they say is, how can we fix it? Let's fix it. Let's do something about it. You can get fixed, but, but I can't, you know? Like, this is just the way of life. I can't fix myself. There's nothing I can do. And I'm okay with that. Yeah, it's scary when it happens and it, I'm frustrated that I have this, but I'm perfectly fine 
with how I'm coexisting with it. I am coexisting with this. I am not trying to cure myself. There is no cure. So I don't think that other people who don't have chronic illnesses should try to cure me because there's no cure. This book is just amazing. It does an amazing job at talking about chronic illnesses and everything. Um, I really, really recommend this one. Now I have um, That Kind of Guy by Talia Hibbert. I absolutely adore Talia Hibbert. If you have not read any of Talia Hibbert's books, please do. She is so diverse in everything that she writes. She'll have characters who are on the autism spectrum. She'll have characters who are plus size. She'll have characters who are of a different race. She'll have characters who have mental disorders or disabilities. She'll have characters who have physical disabilities. She'll have characters who have chronic illnesses. Like, she is amazing. I read this book because I love Talia Hibbert and this was the third book in the Ravenswood series. I had no idea going into this book that this main character woman has my chronic illness. I was listening to it on audio, I believe it's on Audible Escape, and I had no idea that she has POTS. I was listening to this and I heard her say the word. I heard her say the acronym and what it means. Went back and listened to it over and over and over again and honestly just started crying because I finally found something that I felt seen in. The representation is very well done. I will say there's way more to having POTS than is what is described in the book, but what's in the book is completely accurate. I really recommend reading this book if you want to know a little bit more about it. Honestly, this romance is also just great. This is an age gap romance where the woman is older. It's a friends to lovers fake dating one. I love this one so much. Then I have Get a Life Chloe Brown by Talia Hibbert, another Talia Hibbert book that is fantastic. This is my favorite book of the year, by the way. This is about Chloe Brown who has fibromyalgia. She's always lived a sheltered life because of her chronic illness and her parents being very afraid for her because of her chronic illness. So she's kind of lived this um, boring, as you would say, life. So she has a near-death experience in chapter one and realizes she needs to get a life. She finally goes and buys her apartment for herself and makes this list of things she wants to do to get a life. And she meets Redford, who is the superintendent of the building, and he helps her complete this list. It may or may not be a hate to love as well. I absolutely adored this. I thought I would read some quotes in here as well that I really connected to. This is a scene where Chloe is telling Redford about her chronic illness and what it entails. So she talks about how she got pneumonia when she was a kid and it triggered her having fibromyalgia. And so she was talking about how she was sick as a kid. And then she goes on to say, as she was growing up and as she got better and from the pneumonia, it's still, the, the after effects still stuck with her. My body was different. The weight on my chest and the cold, they faded as I got better, but my bones still felt fragile. It never went away. Over the months, I noticed more and more problems. I was exhausted all of the time. I got these awful headaches for no reason. And there was this pain always so much pain. I'd go for a walk and feel like I'd worked every muscle to the point of tearing. If I spent too long on my laptop, my hands would hurt so badly I cried. I started feeling afraid of my own body, like it was a torture chamber. I had been trapped inside. Oh my gosh, that is literally me. That is literally how I feel, which is crazy. When I read this book, I felt so seen and I loved that. But when I asked for help, nobody would listen. I'm lucky my family believes me because for years they were the only ones. I remember one doctor asked to speak to my father, even though I was an adult. He told my father I was physically fine, but they should look into my mental health. I mean, don't get me wrong, my mental health was a mess at that point and having an actual medical professional dismiss me really didn't help. That's just one quote of many that I absolutely connected to with that book. And again, doctor issues. <laughs> That could be a whole video in and of itself. Doctors just frustrate me when it comes to chronic illnesses. Another book that I found chronic illness representation in is Ruckus by LJ Shen. Our heroine in this book has cystic fibrosis. I don't have cystic fibrosis, so I can't speak on this. Also, I can only speak on the POTS representation if it's done well. Just by the way, I don't have any of the other chronic illnesses, obviously. So you would have to have CF to see if this is good representation. Um, I feel like it could have been touched on a little bit more, but that representation is in this book. And this is a childhood crush-ish bully romance, kind of. <laughs> um, this isn't my favorite series, but um, I did like seeing that representation in a book. Now I have one of my favorite books of all time, which is Worley Matched by Emma Chase. I really want to cry. This book is amazing. This book, I felt so seen and so connected because this heroine is like, she is me as a person. This book is a royalty romance and it's kind of like a 
royal version of The Bachelor. So our hero, Henry here is a prince. He is asked to be on The Bachelor Royal Edition, essentially. A bunch of heiresses are in this country are vying for his heart on his TV show and one of the girls who comes brings her sister along with her not as a contestant but as like a companion for her and he may or may not fall for her sister. Her name is Sarah and I love her. She has social anxiety like me and she also has something called temporary dissociative fag fog state fog state. I can't pronounce it. So she has PTSD. When she was a kid her father would get into these rages where he would throw things at her. And so whenever there is a loud, sharp sound, she dissociates and basically remembers nothing. She just sits there with a blank stare on her face. I don't know if that's necessarily a chronic illness, but that is a representation I have never seen in a book before. It made me feel so seen because when I have my episodes, I disassociate and don't remember a thing that's going on at all. I just felt so connected to her and I love her so much. This book is just amazing. And then the last book that I have to talk about is A Curse of Dark and Lonely by Bridget Kemmerer. Um, I love this young adult fantasy book. This one is a retelling of Beauty and the Beast and our heroine is from the real world Earth. She actually has cerebral palsy. I know of a booktuber here on YouTube. Her name is Angela from Blonde Books. She also has cerebral palsy and this is one of her favorite books of all time and she loved the representation in it. I'm linking Angela down below but I loved her video all about this book specifically and how she connected to it so much. I loved the talk of her cerebral palsy and learning more about it through this book. So very quickly I'm just gonna be listing off some books that um, I believe have chronic illnesses that I want to read. I don't know the summaries for them so. This is A Matter of Heart by Amy Fellner uh, Domini. I believe that our heroine has a chronic heart condition in here so that's why I'm very excited to read this one. Next we have The Summer I Found You by Jolene Perry. I believe our heroine just found out she has type 1 diabetes in this book and so it throws her whole life into a new different way and light that she ever expected it to. Very intrigued for this one as well. We also have Five Feet Apart by Rachel Lippincott I believe and our two main characters here um, have cystic fibrosis. I watched the movie and literally bawled my eyes out. I really want to read the book. Um, I believe she just came out with a new book, um, but I really want to read this one as well. I know that Love from A to Z by SK Ali has multiple sclerosis representation in it, and my lovely friend Brie from In Love and Words, I love her so much, um, she actually has multiple sclerosis, and she um, gave this book a really great rating on Goodreads. I'll link her review for it down below for you guys, but this is a young adult novel and our hero, I believe, has multiple sclerosis. Then I found two books um, that are kind of like non-fiction-y. It's not a fiction one. We have Chronic Babe 101 by Jenny Grover. This deals with chronic illness and the cover really intrigued me and so I really want to look more into this one. And then one that I downloaded off of Kenza Unlimited that sounds really good that I really want to read is called Surviving and Thriving with Invisible Chronic Illness by Ilana Jacqueline. Um, the cover intrigued me obviously, but also in the description, like my chronic illness is listed there, which I've never seen in an article or a book or anything of dealing with chronic illnesses. My illness doesn't pop up at all. I loved seeing that in the synopsis, so I can't wait to read that one. We need more representation in books. That's just something we need. I need to see more chronic illness representation in books. It just needs to happen. Um, there are so many people out there in the world who have it who have some form of chronic illness and it is probably one of the least represented things in the media that you see or any form of entertainment that you see. And I just feel like that is so wrong. <laughs> That's so wrong. I need more representation. We need more representation. This is something that a lot of people probably don't even think about that this needs representation for, but it, it needs to happen. It needs to happen. Books like this need to exist. We need more of them. I am very tired. My, I'm losing my voice from staking so long, but this is a subject I'm very passionate about. I just needed to get this information out there and hopefully other people out there will connect to it. And um, please let me know down below if um, you have any questions for me, I'd love to know. And I am always open in my Instagram DMs if you want to chat with me about chronic illnesses or about anything at all. Please feel free to message me. I love talking to people about this sort of thing. Thank you all so, so much for watching or staying this long for a very long video. If you've stayed this long, I don't know, leave a blue heart down below <laughs> for me. I don't know. Um, I want to see how many people have actually stayed till the end. <laughs> Anyways, thank you all so, so much for watching and we'll see y'all soon in my next one. Bye.